so we turn, I turn straight away in here. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In this episode, we're going to look at Don's investigation of himself. Just a few hours ago, Donald Wells released footage of the Funky Shed. That's the shed much lower down on their property, as well as of the Forbidden Shack, the shack that Candace wouldn't let Chris McDonough enter about two weeks ago at the end of July. I don't know about you, but now I understand his version of events regarding his movements in the late afternoon on June 15th, the day Summer Wells disappeared 60 days ago today, a lot better now. That's thanks to his Sermon of the Shacks. Don's investigation was published on the Voices Behind the Wall platform, a channel that has quickly identified itself as sympathetic to Don and Candace, and thus, if you're still not sure what apologia is, or what an apologist is, well, Voices Behind the Wall are apologists for the Wells couple. Chris McDonough started it, of course, in exchange for a somewhat sympathetic ear, he got exclusive access to Candace, but didn't quite snag a one-on-one with Don. The voices behind the wall channel seized the gap. I actually had in mind another opportunistic channel that might do that, but uh, to be quite honest. But uh, this is a common theme in true crime. You take a position and your suspect is either going to distrust you, dislike you, block you, criticize you, and undermine you, you know, attack your credibility, effectively locking you out, or if you're nice to them, if you sing their praises, if you're sympathetic to them, then they're going to feel comfortable and open up, and that's going to boost your popularity, your visibility, and of course, giving um, give, it gives them more and more air to their version of events, unopposed, of course. So as an investigator, do you do your job authentically and transparently, but end up kicked to the curb? Or do you turn on your back and sell your soul to the devil? Or do you do a bit of both? Before we get to this episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. You can click on the light blue icon on the bottom right of your screen. Hit the notifications bell. There will be a live later today at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So you want to Get the notification for that, hit the notification bell, like, share, leave a comment. You probably won't be able to because all all my videos seem to be comments disabled. But if you want to leave a comment, head on to Twitter using the hashtag SummerWells. And let's get started. So we're going to start off with the Forbidden Shack, right? Uh, That is the shack at the um, sort of across from the the Wells home, um, not too far from Grandma's camper, right? It's also where Chris McDonough drove up to, basically where he parked when he first arrived at at the property. I've got four observations to share about Don's footage of the Forbidden Shack. So firstly, I wondered whether all those ladders and debris and planks and so on piled against the outer window, you know, facing you as you approach it. Uh, whether you know that was something that had been put there since the interview room visited the property. So there are essentially two moments in uh, the McDonough video where you get a fairly good look at the Forbidden Shack. Um, I'll put a link to his video in the description. The first is when he arrives. Um, when he arrives at the property, you get quite a good look at the Forbidden Shack. The second is near the end of his coverage at about 22 and a half minutes. In the second glimpse, it appears that none of those objects are leaned against the wall from a particular angle. But when you backtrack to McDonough's arrival, when he drives right up to it, you can clearly see from that angle that it does appear to be similar or the same, certainly from the outside, as we've seen Don's footage released a few hours ago. I think one can also talk about the door in the footage of of Chris McDonough, the door seems to be somewhat open. In Don's footage, the door seems a bit more closed, doesn't it? In in any event, that's quite good for Don. In the Chris Watts case, when the cops arrived a day after the incident, which is exactly three years ago today, the 14th of August, quite a few things had changed between the one day, between the 13th and the 14th. The suitcase had moved from downstairs to upstairs, the beds were made, and so on. 
The second point is, coming back to the Wells case, the second point is the plastic sheeting inside the shed. Some of it is peeled back, do you notice? Now, if it obscured the window once upon a time, it's since fallen back. Now, obviously, if that sheeting was still in place of the window, if Don had shot the inside with that sheeting still in place, would that be more suspicious than if it seems to be neglected and unused? What do you guys think? The other thing is the outside of the shed looks fairly derelict and it's easy to miss. It's easy to think, well, you know, it's pretty ramshackle, nothing's going on there. But when you go inside, aside from the mess inside, it looks fairly well constructed. And there's also that toolbox which looks pretty expensive and and quite new. So you can see, um, you know, Candace actually referred to those tools that that is what Don kept in that shed. So can you imagine Don using the shed fairly often if he works in construction and his tools are here? The third point, having been inside the forbidden shed, having been shown what's inside, why was it a problem that Chris couldn't go inside? What, 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 was, there, what was wrong with showing the inside of it? Then the final point, in his 14-minute video, Don spends less than a minute inside the Forbidden Shed. He spends about five or six times um, that amount of time, not necessarily at the funky shed, but sort of in the area around it. He spends quite a lot of time not in the sheds, just elsewhere, right? So inside the Forbidden Shed, we see what appear to be ladders, and the one area that's not really shown here is the ceiling. Are there lights inside? One would imagine if his tools are there, perhaps he sometimes works in the shed at night. Hard to know. So the funky shed, you know, I think um, having followed Don's route, one can actually go back to Google Maps and get a proper sense of where exactly this is. And it, I, th I find that quite interesting. I find it quite interesting that in order to get there, one's got to drive all the way around. Certainly not the way that I understood how he arrived at his property in his early version of events. In any event, at 2.29 in the Voices Behind the Wall um, on the, on, in that video, uh, where Don is investigating while he's driving on Beach Creek Road, that's the main road that Ben Hill Road terminates into, Don says, so we turn, I turn straight away in here. And he sort of corrects himself. So we turn, I turn straight away in here. It's important to stress that Don's reenacting the events as well as narrating them. And so he's using the same vehicle, retracing the same route while narrating the actual events. And while he does that, he misspeaks. So the question is, was he driving on that day with someone else? Was there a we in the vehicle? I have wondered whether Candace and Don didn't drive together at some point late on June the 15th. Candace has admitted that she drove around frantically after uh, someone went missing. So we know they were both in a vehicle after some had disappeared, after she was gone, as they put it. But were they in the vehicle together? Candace says she threw her phone into the back of Don's pickup, but Don wasn't driving his pickup that day. Now, the interesting thing is Don bypasses the funky shed when he arrives and in his reenactment sort of avoids directing his camera towards it. But once past it, pans left to Chalet Wells up on the hillside. Then he takes us across a rough, grassy, overgrown landscape better suited to a pickup. He drives, in his words, straight to the creek. You can still see two tracks, or well, I think you can still see two tracks left by a vehicle in the long grass through the windscreen. Not the sort of place you'd really want to drive, especially if it had rained um, recently. Don spends a couple of minutes now showing us trees and the creek and a passage through the woods cleared for the power lines. Um, it's interesting that this area is on the opposite side of Chalet Wells as the access road. So if the cops were there, they'd be on the far side. And so that's where Don starts his search for summer. Don's final port of call is the funky shed. He claims he's never utilized it. I find that quite an interesting word. Um, I don't know what you guys think of that. Um, 
Approaching the funky shed, the door is already wide open, and Don describes the interior for us. You know, he sort of controls the narrative by telling us what is inside, and he says, just a bunch of junk, whatever. It's, it is mostly empty inside, but a lot tidier than the forbidden shed by comparison. There's a lawnmower inside, which is quite an expensive piece of equipment, as well as a gas lamp perched against the wall. Don also goes to the trouble to point out that part of the roof is missing. Interestingly, during this reenactment, plus voiceover narration, Don admits, I think for the second or third time, that he's not sure if he even looked in the funky shed. So he drives by it on the way to the creek in his reenactment, then drives back, and in his reenactment shows it to us, shows us inside, but there's no narration to go with it. I mean, he tells us what we're seeing, but he doesn't really say what is happening at this point. He doesn't say, I looked in here or anything like that. In all, he spends about 15 seconds inside the funky shed. Once outside, he reverts again to his voiceover narration, describing where he was driving. From there, he drives back to Chalet Wells. And of course, when he arrives at Chalet Wells, quite a few dogs are right there waiting for him. The next six minutes of Don's shack video are spent along Chimney Top Road. I'm not going to go into that. So there will be a, a live stream, and um, I'm going to be revising my working theory that I've already presented. It's not going to change radically. It's just a couple of fine tunings. Um, so I'll be following up this video with that, uh, a live stream at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I think that's 7 p.m. in the United Kingdom. This isn't the first time we've had a potential suspect investigate their own crime scene. We saw the same thing with Amanda Knox, Oscar Pistorius, and Triple X murderer Henry van Breda. In the live stream, we'll revisit the points made about the swimming hole in a, that was made in the video prior to this one. So if you haven't watched that, make sure you do. We'll talk a little about an accident, um, what an accident is, and how that possibly features into this case. Some people have said... I don't understand, you know, if it was an accident, blah, blah, blah. And then the possible mechanism of this crime in more detail. I'll take you through how the TCRS version has been slightly fine-tuned in light of the latest information, specifically the increased likelihood of drowning, in my opinion, as well as the location of the funky shed and what it means. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.